Hey, Grace Church. This is Pastor Keisha coming to you from Roseau, Minnesota, where I serve as the children and family pastor at Roseau Covenant Church. And it is great to be with you again. I have uh, had the privilege of sharing a message with you before. Thrilled to be back with you again. So thankful for this medium where we can meet um, through, inter through uh, the internet even when we're not able to meet together physically. So it's it's good to be with you. And um, I heard that you had just recently started a new series on Back to the Basics. And so I'm excited today to talk to you about love. And love is one of those words that you hear a lot. We throw it around a lot. Um, I love pizza. I love ice cream. Um, some of you love Ludovisk. That is a love I don't understand, but nonetheless, some of you probably love Ludafisk. Uh, it's, a, it's a word we throw around a lot. Um, I love my family. I love my husband. I love um, what God has called me to. And so it's a word we use for a lot of different, in a lot of different ways. In fact, the Greeks had four, four different words for love that they used. And so just to describe the different nuances and... Um, English, we just have the one word, um, but the Bible talks about love. Certainly the Old Testament had some laws about how people were to treat each other, specifically how the Jewish people were to treat each other and to treat not only Jewish people, but uh, foreigners, um, orphans, widows. Um, they, had, they had many laws for that. And Certainly Paul wrote about love. Jesus certainly talked about love. And the Apostle John wrote about love. So I'd like to take a look at love today uh, through one of my favorite texts. And it's one in, found in the book of Luke, um, chapter 10, starting verse 25 through 37. And it's often called the Good Samaritan. Uh, but I'd like to read that to you. And let's see what Jesus had to say about love. So I'll start again in Luke 10, starting with verse 25. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Now just to give comment as we go through this text, they were the uh, experts in religious law the Pharisees, Sadducees were all really annoyed with Jesus and were trying to find ways to get rid of him. And so they were constantly looking for ways to trip him up or to discredit him in the view, in the eyes of, of many of his followers. And so that's where this, this question is probably coming from. Jesus replies to this um, expert in religious law, well, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answers, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And in there, he is quoting from Deuteronomy and from Leviticus. So these would have been, again, laws that he, as an expert in, rel in um, religious law, certainly would have known about. And Jesus tells him, you're right. Do this and you will live. Now, the man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And I'm sure he was looking for Jesus to say, well, it's your family, your friends, your fellow Jews. Yet Jesus replies with this story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. Now, this road was known to be a pretty dangerous area, so this wouldn't have shocked this Jewish audience that was listening in. Jesus then goes on to say, by chance, a priest came along, and when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Now, this would have been surprising for the Jewish people listening, because... I'm sure when they thought, okay, this story about this Jewish man, he's beat up, he's left for dead. Oh, good, a priest is coming by, he'll help him, is what they probably would have been anticipating in this story. And for Jesus to say, but he saw the man lying there, and he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. That would have got their attention. 
Now, why would the priest have done this in this story? Well, he maybe feared being uh, becoming ceremonially unclean if they touched a dead body or anything. They would have to go through this whole ritual to become ceremonially clean again, and it was a big, it was a big nuisance, and it probably would have taken many days. And so, even though he should have, under obligation, gone to help this person, he chose not to because it was probably more convenient. Then Jesus says a temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there. Now the Jewish audience again would have been, oh good, well if the priest didn't stop, at least this temple assistant will help the guy out. And yet Jesus says, but he also passed on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. Now this would have made the Jewish audience stop in their tracks because the Samaritans and the Jewish people did not like each other. And that's an understatement. They despised each other as it said, a despised Samaritan came by. They really were, had, had not only been mean to each other, but they would um, burn each other's temples down. They would destroy property. They would, it was okay to um, treat a Samaritan way worse than you could treat a, a Jewish person. And, a, and that was fine in their law. Um, so there really, it was set up where these two people groups just hated each other. So for this Jewish audience to hear this now, that this Jewish man was left for dead on the side of the road, the priest didn't stop to help. The temple assistant didn't stop to help. Now the Samaritan man has come, and they're probably expecting the worst that he's going to, if the man wasn't dead now, he's going to be. This man's going to torture him, going to, to be cruel to him. And yet Jesus goes on in his story and says, When the Samaritan saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man, and if the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Jesus now says, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? You asked who you need to, who your neighbor is. I now gave you the story. Who was the neighbor to this man? And the man replies, the one who showed him mercy. Do you notice he couldn't even say the word Samaritan? I don't think he could bring himself to even say that. But he acknowledges the neighbor is the one who shows him mercy. Then Jesus said, Yes, now go and do the same. You know, I love this, this parable. So thankful that Jesus shared this. Because first of all, when he's talking about love, he says right away to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength in this story. The, the expert of religious law states that and to love your neighbor as yourself. And really, if you look at the the Ten Commandments, as well as all the rest of the laws, that uh, the Levitical laws, they all really rest on those two things, that you are to love God with everything you have, heart, soul, mind, and strength, as well as to love people, to love your neighbor. In fact, in Matthew 5, uh, Jesus says we are to love your enemies, not just our family members, not just our friends, not just the people who like us and we like them, but we are to love our enemies. And this parable is a great example of that for the Jewish people. I think Jesus' message in this parable is clear too, that we are to love in action. The man didn't just show compassion, show love, and, and be on his way. But his love took the form of taking care of him and bringing him to a safe place, taking care of his needs, staying with him to make sure he was okay. 
We are to love those in need, whoever it is we encounter on our path. This man was walking that, that dangerous road, and there was somebody in front of him who was in need, and he stopped to help him. I think that's God's message for us, too. Who are we to help? Who's our neighbor? It's whoever we encounter during the day, whoever God puts in our path that needs help. Not just our friends, not just our family, not just people like us, but whoever God puts in our path. John, um, in his first uh, letter, writes, Let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Now, some of you might be getting a little nervous that, you know, that sounds an awful lot like works, that we're salvation by works, and and and. I'm, I'm not saying that. I don't think you will find that anywhere in the text, that that's what God is saying. Salvation can't be earned. And we can't love our way into heaven. Our obligation to love is a byproduct of God's loving generosity towards us. It's a response. I may choose to make my husband his favorite dinner. We had tacos actually earlier tonight. That's his favorite dinner. Now, I'm not doing that to earn his love. I'm doing that as a response to his love for me and my love for him. I think our response to God's amazing love for us is to run to the world and love other people. To love others, to bear fruit. That is where our love for our neighbor comes from. It's a reflection of the divine love that God has shown us. Christ's love for us compels us to run to the world and to just love on them. It's a reflection. It's a response. It's a natural byproduct of being loved by the God who created the universe and who loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us taking our place so we might have a restored relationship with God. We celebrated a couple weeks ago Easter. Jesus dying and rising. What an amazing love for us that the Father has for us. In fact, Scripture defines in, in John that there is no greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for their friends. God sent his Son to die for us so that we could have a restored relationship with God. What love that is. God has done so much for us and loved us so much. How could we do anything any less than to turn around and love our neighbors, to love our enemies, to love everyone we encounter? Our loving others reflects a changed heart. It is the evidence of what God has done for us. A person can't come into a real relationship with God without being transformed into a loving person. The love of God takes control of our natures and changes us. It transforms us. Which makes us wonder sometimes, I do, makes me wonder, do, do we get it? Do, do we really get how much God loves us. If you've ever read the book Crazy Love from Francis Chan, you already know it's an amazing book. If you haven't read, haven't read it, I highly recommend it. But he mentions in there, and, and I'm quoting him here, have you ever wondered if we're missing it? It's crazy to think about it. The God of the universe, the creator of nitrogen and pine needles, galaxies and E minor, loves us with a radical, unconditional, self-sacrificing love. And what is our typical response? We go to church, sing songs, and try not to cuss. Do we get it? Are we missing it? Are we missing how truly much God loves us? Are our actions proof of a changed heart? Do our lives look any differently than the rest of the world? Are we loving? Are we loving like Christ did? Reaching out to the hurting, to the poor, to the oppressed, to the lost? 
in the middle of this COVID-19, do our lives look any different than everybody else's? The Apostle John writes that God is love and that we love because God first loved us. Since Jesus gave up his life for us, we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Are we laying down our lives, our dreams, our desires, our for what God would have for us? I can guarantee you it's a better trade. Jesus talked about loving in action when he said that the king will say to those on his right, Come, inherit the kingdom, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. How we treat other people so matters. We're doing it to Jesus. Jesus loves each and every one of those people. And how we treat them is, is in essence how we're treating Jesus. When we do that to the least anything, to the least of these, we're doing it to Jesus. So it is my prayer for all of us that we would be so in love with God that we are transformed and we are changed so that our will is changed to God's will. And I think if we truly get how much God loves us, our will will be in line with God's will. We won't want the things we used to want. Keeping up with the Joneses will seem like a total waste of time. In fact, we'll realize it's the Joneses who are really missing out. God's love can radically change us. And it will when we realize how much God loves us. We will be a new creation in Christ. We will have a, a changed heart. Our will will not be our own anymore. We will realize that this earthly world is not our home. We will have our eyes fixed on things that are eternal rather than on the comforts of here and now. We will love God and our neighbor with all that God has given us. You know, I used to have a bracelet that said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? You maybe have seen them. They've been popular for years. WWJD, what would Jesus do? A great reminder for us to stop and think, what would Jesus do in these situations? I'm not sure if you've seen, I just saw it on Facebook, but there's a response to that question. HWLF, you can get it on bracelets and t-shirts and hats. HWLF. He would love first. Jesus wouldn't judge. Jesus would just love. If we truly experience the love of God and if truly get it, we will know that we have a Father who loves us beyond anything we can describe or understand. And that love will spill out to all people. We will see our neighbor and our enemy as Jesus sees them. Someone that Jesus gave his life for. And he calls us to love them. May we, like Jesus, choose to love first. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you loved us first. Lord, I just pray for all of us that you would so radically get our attention that we would understand this amazing radical love you have for us, that we would be changed, we would be transformed, that your love would so fill our hearts that it overflows into everything we say and everything we do. And we show love to every person that you put in our path. Lord, help us to love our neighbors as ourselves, even when they're different from us. 
even when we don't agree with them. Lord, help us, like you, to love first. Amen. Grace Church, it's been a pleasure being with you today, and um, I just pray a blessing on your entire week. Until we see each other again, bye-bye.